And it is, of course, Veterans Day. And who do we talk to on Veterans Day? Rob Christensen and Takara yeah. Mallard, our writers. What's Hello. up, guys? Yes. Well, I got my veterans tree up. You know? Do you? Did you put your? Do, <laughs> no, no, no. That would be a lovely thing. I mean, what would you I make up my own. With? I would. Uh, you got to put your DD two fourteen out for Uncle Sam. Nice. And if you were a good veteran, uh -huh. he breaches your door and makes a payment on your Dodge Ram. Wow. Is that a car? I, I don't know trucks. <laughs> it's, it's, but Dodge if you're Ram a bad a veteran, mm. if you're if you're a bad veteran, Cold. you get a lump. A lump. A lump. Just. You, you got to get that thing checked out. It's... <laughs> oh, no. On Veterans Day, do you check in with, like, the other guys in your in your platoon and your, like... I have a list. Not necessarily guys I served with, but, you know, I run into veterans along the way in college right. and stuff like that. So I'm kind of tight with other veterans, and I do have a list. I send them all a text, Happy Veterans Day. And if we're in the same city, maybe we'll get a drink. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's that. really nice. That's and nice. is that a day, like, where everybody kind of checks up on each other and is like, Hey, man, how you doing? How's this year been? You know, uh, you hang it tough. Everything's good. Yeah, for me it is. Yeah, that's the day that we'll catch up. Uh, that's that's really nice. And Takara, I know your family. All all veterans. Is this the day where they go to the VA and they go, "All right, guys, this year is the year we're getting it together." <laughs> you know, everyone. I I, I get I got a nice group chat going. I say Happy Veterans Day. Some people oh, tell lovely. me to fuck off because they don't. You know, <laughs> they don't care. Uh, That's which is so really right. nice. And these yeah. are family members. Oh, absolutely. They, of course That's... not. They think I'm being facetious, but I really do mean it. <laughs> Takara, how, why would anyone ever think you're being facetious? That doesn't make any sense. You know, I, yeah, you know, I don't think it makes sense. It makes sense, sense to me. <laughs> Rob, be quiet. Be quiet, Rob. All right, guys. I'm going to talk to Safi Rauf. Now, he's got a fascinating story, but ultimately it comes down to this. He's trying to find a path for Afghans who helped the United States military uh, during our, our war, find their way to the United States because we abandoned them. Rob, did you have any experience with Afghan uh, interpreters, contractors, any of those folks? No, the Air Force is kind of a cushy deal. I right. did not have to go over there. I was very far from war, and uh, I did dance on uh, some bar tops when I was... <laughs> oh, so you, you had more of a Top Gun experience. I did, yes. Uh, understood. Do you have folks that you know that you... Uh, uh, are invested in this issue at all or uh, have have expressed feelings to you about the topic of abandoning those folks? Uh, yeah, I mean, people, like, they're our allies. They, these guys, they worked with them on the ground. They want these interpreters out like they would want an American citizen out of there. It's, it's the oh, same thing. it's that, yeah, it's, it's that deep. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, uh, Safi's been working on it tirelessly, and, and, and maybe that's the next little... Uh, the next little fight we can poke our noses into. So uh, we'll talk to him and then we'll grab you guys on the way out. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, man, we're very excited today to be talking to Safi Rauf. He is the president and founder of Human First Coalition. First of all, Safi, welcome welcome to the show. Great to see you. Thank you, you so much for having me. Thank uh, you. It's, it's our pleasure. So we were down in D.C. and we were talking to uh, Dick Durbin about the Afghan Adjustment Act and how in this country... We had a lot of Afghan interpreters and a lot of other contractors who are Afghan who worked with the United States uh, through that 20 year period of the war. And at the end of it, as the Taliban took over the country, we abandoned our allies. And I run into this gentleman by the name of Safi Rauf, who is parked outside of the Capitol and you're lobbying to get this Afghan Adjustment Act, and you and I start to talk, and you start telling me your story, and it is, I mean, honestly, you're James Bond. I think you may be, I know they're looking for another James Bond, and I think you may be him. Uh, tell me a little bit about just your story. Um, you are Afghan-American, yes? So, uh, John, I was born in a refugee camp, and I actually uh, lived- Where, where, Rocky? Uh, in Pakistan. Okay. Um, so, and, and that's where I, I was raised for 17 years. Uh, oh, and Lord. at 17, I, I came to the U.S. My parents came to the U.S. four years ahead of me. So I was mm -hmm. separated from my family at 12 until I was 17 uh, for four years before I joined In a, in a refugee camp. In, in, in a refugee Pakistan. camp. Right. So when Kabul fell and then all of these refugees are scrambling and some are, you know, falling from planes and trying to stick onto those planes trying to get out and i see myself all over again like i'm like that kid who was right. in a refugee camp trying to survive and you know a lot of people saw that and they couldn't understand they were like why would somebody 
stick on to a, a, a moving plane and, 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 and not realize that they're going to fall from the sky to their death. And I was like, I understand this because it's either a chance uh, to live or actually, you know, die trying. And, and a lot of refugees do that. Uh, you know, from from all across the world. It's desperation and, and an escape from, from chaos. It's the desperation for survival. It's, uh, you know, actually there is a better chance of survival getting on that boat versus staying in a, in, right. in a war-torn country. That's right. And so you go, you're living in, in Pakistan and you're there for 17 years. And I imagine your parents go, but you're still, I don't know if people understand the uncertainty of a life in limbo when you are when you are stateless when you are uh, a refugee and i imagine it's very difficult to maintain a hopeful future for yourself yeah absolutely you know so you're sort of living in 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 hiding you don't tell mm -hmm. people you are a, a refugee you are outside you kind of pretend like you're from there and you 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 I, I'm, I'm fluent in six languages and that's because everywhere you, you go uh you, you want to learn the language because if you don't know the language people are going to mm -hmm. know that you're a refugee you're not from there and then you'll be persecuted you'll be targeted and right. and you know because uh it, as, as it happens in every country like the united states uh people don't like uh refugees uh because oh, I'm they not, think I'm that, not, is that yeah. is that how things are you sure in the united <laughs> states too i can't i can't believe that so. yeah yeah I, I i i don't know i just uh you know if if, if we go to the the staten island or something I maybe I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but you did you 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 come to the united states and i thought what was fascinating about this and is you join the military yeah of yeah, the united states yes so the the when I came to the U.S., I became a U.S. citizen in 2012, and the first time, uh, that's when the first time I voted. That's the first time I actually uh, held a passport, and that's the first time I could, uh, you know, feel a sense of belonging to a country uh, being uh, a citizen. And, you know, of all places, I uh, my family moved to Nebraska, so... <laughs> <laughs> Corn huskers, man! Yeah, so, um, and, and, and as bad as it was... As in, you know, there's still a lot of racism, and you know, when when they see a, a, a brown kid, especially at a and time it's post when nine eleven, and yes, and, we're, and people yes. know we're at war with the countries you're from. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So even though you are still dealing with a lot of that, but at the same time, you have a home, you have a family, you have a way of uh, to provide for your family, you have a way of uh, sort of, you know. Uh, participating in the civil uh, uh, discourse, if if, if we, mm -hmm. we can call it that, you know, it's uh, we used to be able incredible. to call it that. But yes, <laughs> you're you joined the United States military in, in what year? In 2012, uh, as an American, I actually went back to Afghanistan from 2012 to 2016 and served as a cultural advisor with the special operations. Uh, so okay. I was with the task force from 2012 to 2016 and served all across Afghanistan, uh, north, south, central, and, and did a lot of work and did a lot of sensitive uh, work. And we had a lot of local interpreters. And when the time came for their SIVs, uh, when they, you know, you, SIVs you talk, are special immigration special immigrant visas that visas. are given to people who've yeah, been allies so, in the United States or helped or those things. Yeah, exactly. So I was working with them. And when a time came and we needed to give those uh, recommendation letters to those uh, local people, what happened was, this was one of the most secretive organizations in the United States military. Mm -hmm. So working with locals, they're like, well, sorry, man, I can't put my name on this sheet of paper uh, because we don't exist. Um, so, so the how people that they're working for are so high up on the security level that they can't even acknowledge that these local Afghans are helping the United States effort. And, and obviously people will see what what predicament that puts those individuals in uh, when it comes later. So you're you're really spending four years in Afghanistan as a part of the United States military working with Special Operations Command until 2016. Yeah. yeah, I'm training these women. I'm training these guys, these Afghan women uh, who are doing incredibly important work like John, I can tell you I can I can tell you this. 
that we didn't have another 9-11 because of those people. We literally stopped a guy as he was getting on a plane to the United States from Kabul airport with the help of these people that we trained. These were incredibly courageous people who were going, you know, inside the Taliban, going inside Al Qaeda, going inside of these terrorist organizations. And, and incredibly and, dangerous work, not just for themselves, work. but I yeah. think if, if we know anything about uh, the Taliban and, and Al Qaeda and the way they operate, they will go after your family. I Absolutely. mean, they are, you're, you're putting your entire uh, lineage at risk when you yeah. take the step to start working with the United States uh, yeah. in, in this environment. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly what I tell people. It's like those people who served alongside our troops, they did not serve Afghanistan as much as they served the United States. For 20 years, they kept those terrorists at bay. And, so in 2016, and, you come back. Yes. And, and you come back to the United States and you, and you start school. Yeah, I start school and I also joined the uh, U.S. Navy Reserve as a corpsman. Wow, uh, Okay. So, uh, and, so now and, you've, you've worked for the United States Army for four years. Now you're a uh, U.S. Navy Reserve. You're keeping an eye on what's going on in Afghanistan. But at that moment, you don't have any idea that there's about to be uh, a withdrawal, a collapse, or any of those things. When did that come up on your radar that made you go back to Afghanistan? So I, I graduate from Georgetown. And, you know, so when it fell, I, I just couldn't sit around and watch i was like i am not going to watch this while i know i can help them i know i can i can i can do something there so i got right on it and started uh evacuating people and before i knew it i was running a team of over a hundred uh in in afghanistan in in, in pakistan in tajikistan uzbekistan and the united and states and when is this give me give me the time frame on that this is by August 19, we had a full on operation center right outside the White House. Like we were across the street. You put together this team. It's 100 people. Uh, you've got this incredible organization. I think someone told me you were uh, responsible for getting out almost 10,000 Afghans uh, yeah. as the U.S. was exiting the country. Yeah, uh, not only that, John, but also 1,400 U.S. citizens after August 31st. So this is when the U.S. Oh, wow. pulled out. Uh, so, so you can imagine how uh, how important and crucial that work. We we were my organization was actually the first one who got a flight out after the withdrawal. It was 117 U.S. citizens. Safi, how are you? How are you doing that? I mean, the United States had trouble getting flights out at that point. How are you doing it? And how are you getting these folks out? How are you coordinating it? Are you doing it through a land route into Pakistan and then, you know, getting that, what they call the lily pad, finding another country? Or are you actually getting flights out from Kandahar or Kabul or uh, any of those places? Yeah, so that's where it comes. I actually went to Afghanistan. I went back to Kabul. I sat down with the Taliban leadership and I was like, hey, look, guys, what this is in your best interest. Uh, these flights, this is how you start looking like a legitimate government by when a flight goes out of Kabul to another international airport that tells the international community that hey look at the Taliban they can actually uh, uh they can actually do this so i go there i sat down with them i convinced them and then you know this it, it, there were a lot of uh you know uh hiccups in, in that but uh, by the end we were able to get the flight directly out of kabul uh to to abu dhabi amazing and, hey listen man i US. see the hiccups that go on when you're trying to fly united <laughs> from like newark to tampa like i can't yeah. i can't even imagine sort of the the intrigue of that so you yeah. start putting these flights together and you're and you're getting out 10,000 people and do you have to stay on the ground in Afghanistan to ensure that each one of these flights and all of these uh, passengers are given safe passage are you working directly with the Taliban at that time to get that done Yes. Uh, so I was working directly with the Minister of Civil Aviation, the Minister of Interior. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm working directly with the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs. The bureaucracy and, of the Taliban. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, 
they all sort of know too that you know i'm kind of you know working with 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 state department and you know i'm right. not just some because uh, I, I i do run an ngo you know my ngo is registered uh in the afghanistan and it's registered here um and and, and i'm doing this and i actually tell you gotta be me, concerned for your safety i mean that the, it's the, the taliban and i know assume they know ironic. who you are yeah you know what's ironic taliban gave me eight bodyguards to make sure I was I was safe. <laughs> the uh, Taliban were protecting you. So they saw you as an asset in maybe reestablishing their credibility. Yes, exactly. They wow. it, all of them are on board with this and, and we are doing phenomenal. And then on August uh sorry, on on, on December eighteenth yeah. of last year, I was taken by the Taliban, uh taken a hostage by a rogue element within the Taliban, their general directorate of intelligence. This wait, organization... Wait, wait, so you're, you, you, were, you were captured by an offshoot of the Taliban. Was this something that you think was planned with your bodyguards? Like, was this, were, were you, did someone turn on you? No, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't the the Taliban that I was working with. Uh, Taliban are uh, are fragmented. It's not a monolith. Uh, and and, oh. and this general directorate of intelligence actually operates outside the system. And, and they're not communicating to each other. And there is no central authority necessarily that's that's keeping track of it. No, no. It's uh, it's there is no accountability on these parts and they are the ones that are actually taking a lot of foreigners hostage and and right. you know john uh of what i'm tracking i'm tracking at least five u.s citizens who are held by them since august uh of right this now year. now do these do, do these folks understand who they've captured do they know you're this high value target that's been working to evacuate afghans and americans out of the country does this minister of intelligence does he understand who you are so they have an idea but it uh -huh. gets more interesting so <laughs> wait what no Zoppy, it can't get more interesting <laughs> this is the most interesting um, story i've heard it's it's a it's a good party trick like when i go to parties somebody's like oh yeah you know i in college i was i played football and then i'm like well i was taken a hostage so then <laughs> the conversation kind of uh <laughs> you, you, you can is... one up almost anybody that you come in with all right yeah and, and and i can get away with almost anything now it's if somebody if if, if 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 somebody is mad at me i was like well you can't be mad at me because i was a hostage i was a hostage uh, <laughs> uh, with the Taliban. Uh, uh and 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 you know what's funny is i'm not the only one who uses that my girlfriend uses it too Come uh, on, your girlfriend was taken <laughs> hostage by the Taliban as well. No, she was, uh, but 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 she she went through it. Uh, she she has uh, she has a lot of par a huge part in in my release. Actually, she went oh, okay. to she went to war with the with with, with the Biden administration. You know, uh, uh, she she has this forty five minute phone call with uh, Assistant Secretary of State State Wendy Sherman, and this call is just you know absolute. Uh, you know, amazing of how, you know, this, uh, uh, this woman who is, who, she's a Broadway director and, you know, she has no idea of, of, of the, 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 the nuances of bureaucracy and uh, foreign relations, but she's smart. So uh, she, she, you know, she gives uh, Wendy Sherman a run for her money. <laughs> um, Safi, you're, you're going to turn this into a musical, aren't you? You're um, uh, actually, gonna, so is, is Lin Manuel Miranda already on board <laughs> to play Safi Ralph in uh, The Hostage? This this is incredible. How how long were you held by the Taliban? A uh, hundred and five days, three and a half months. Holy shit, yeah. Safi! And and when they hold you, is it you know Americans? I think have a stereotypical view of a dank dungeon uh, tied to a chair, bread and water. Is, is that generally? how this goes down uh partially actually some of that is so i was taken to a basement this room was uh eight foot by eight foot uh uh and and you know uh we were the we, we got two meals a day and it was uh rice and bread uh and were you there, were you held with others or were you in solitary yeah so so, so that's that's john 
Uh, I was also this is uh, crazy. I was I was also t uh, so my brother is with me as well. My entire family is running this operation. Uh, you know, all of them voluntarily. Did your brother ever turn to you and say, you couldn't have run a Wendy's. You couldn't have gone into business doing something else. You had to drag us all back to Afghanistan to get captured by the Taliban. John, the, the, the most difficult part of being a hostage was being with, stuck with your brother for 105 <laughs> days in an in a, in a, in a eight by eight foot room. And, 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 you know, you're not taking showers either. So oh uh, you can... You can only, John, can, can you even in normal circumstances, you know, no, be with, listen, we, <laughs> uh, I shared a room with mine for a while. Not, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not pleasant. And, uh, and, and I didn't even have to deal with the Taliban at that point, but damn. Uh, so you guys are, you're together for this hundred days. Are you in communication with anybody other than your captors? Are you getting any messages in and any messages out? Well, that's where my, uh, you know, the, the work I had done before when that's when it comes into use, I start turning the guards and some of the guards starts uh, working for me. Uh, and, you know, at this point, my family, nobody has any idea where we, we are, who is holding us oh. and if we are this alive or actually some right. people were, were telling my family that we were executed. You know, we were just oh, quietly boy. executed and, you know, thrown somewhere and because they had no idea. But I was able to on day 17, I was able to uh, turn one of the guards and used his phone. He let you use his phone. Well, it's a longer story than that. It's uh, <laughs> he. he... <laughs> First, let me just get to the real stuff. What kind of data plan did he have and what were the international charges on the call? You, you were able to actually then get a, and, and you got a message out on day 17. Who did you send the message to? So uh, initially, I sent the message to my team that was in Kabul uh, okay. and, and then uh, that you were alive and that you were captured. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, just that part where how we we turned that guard could be turned into a movie itself. But it, it it's uh, it, it, it was and and then slowly and and you know how i got out is 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 a story of you know love and dedication and 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 family as well right. you know uh day 45 uh my family including my my dad my mom my brother that my other brother one is stuck with me the other is in the US right. and my parents are in the US and my sister-in-law they all come to Kabul um, and uh, now are they under protection of the talent? Are they under, how do they come there without thinking, oh, we're just going to get thrown into the same room? Yeah. So, so John, my dad, he's a, he's a very humble guy. He's a veterinarian, but he wields the kind of power in, in, in the community that no one is going to, you know, mess with him. So he He's comes to Kabul. He, he commands respect. He demands respect. And yes, and, and that is the U.S. government in any way involved in this at this point, or is it just your family? Uh, yes. The, so the U.S. government is involved in this, and mm -hmm. and and they are uh, doing everything. But the Taliban are not talking to them. The Taliban are not giving them any information. So the information they're getting, and and you see, like. I evacuated 1,400 U.S. citizens, and I also mm -hmm. evacuated President Biden's interpreter. Uh, so at this point, President Biden knows me by my first name. So I am on President's uh, daily brief every day. Uh, <clears throat> this and, is and, bananas. And are the negotiations based on, we'll give you a certain amount of money, or are they saying, look, for a guy who is who is on the president's daily brief, I'm going to need two bomb makers and somebody else to get released for you to even have a shot at this. Like you're a valuable target at that point. Yeah. And, and, and John, that's where my dad comes into the picture. So my dad comes to Kabul with my mom. He goes directly to the director of uh, general directorate of intelligence. He sits across the table from him and he tells him this. He's, I have 11 children. I have 28 grandchildren. I have four great grandchildren. I have two brothers and three sisters, and all of them have that many children and grandchildren. 
and I have hundreds of cousins and then my extended family goes beyond thousands and my tribe is the largest tribe in all of Afghanistan. You're holding my son. I come to you as a father who has limitless love for his children. I am asking you humbly to release my son, uh, oh release my, my sons too at this time. And You're furthermore, cry. this he, is unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and he also tells him that the chair you're sitting in, my uh, my friend used to sit in that chair and we fought together against the Russians. And this director knows him. He's like, oh, he was your friend. And the, the director takes my dad's hand and tell, looks him in the eyes and says, I will release your son as long as the U.S. sends a plane to pick him up. And, and that, that was the agreement. The U.S. sends a plane to pick me up and, and he will release us. And, and this man, his name is Abdul Haq Wasik, and yeah. he was held in Guantanamo for 12 years. Holy he was okay. he was released in exchange for a hostage exchange. He was released in in exchange for Bo Bergdahl. So he knows oh the game. But when my dad tells him this story, yeah. He is one he's moved, but also at the same time he doesn't want any issues. Right. Um so then this is a month before I got released. This is when my girlfriend went to war with the White Wait House. Wait a minute, a month before, and, and I know you're about to tell me something. Yeah. It took them a month to send you a plane? Exactly. So there were several things at play here. One, you know, a lot mm. hostages historically are have been, like, Bo Bergdahl was released in exchange for five top Taliban commanders, including this guy right. who's holding me. Uh, you know, Nazanin Radcliffe was recently released for 393 million uh, pounds, which again is is not mer worth a lot because of Liz Truss, and you know the, the pound is <laughs> is not much. I did not but... expect you to take a swing at the uh, uh, six week British Prime Minister, but all right, yeah. now here so... where we are. This is so... first of all. Let me just clarify. Earlier, I had said you were James Bond. Uh, I have now. Uh, I'm gonna amend that you're batman you're not james bond you're batman and uh continue with the story you've got a month to get a plane from the united states yes so um initially the u.s is like okay we're gonna send a plane we're gonna we're gonna do this and we're gonna get him out everything is happening uh and on march 23rd uh of last year taliban basically didn't allow girls to go to school so that's when the administration sort of started walking back on their promise of sending a plane. They didn't explicitly say it, but it probably looked bad for the administration to go to a country where girls are not allowed to go to school. But they're not going for a, you know, a, a, a stroll or a visit or a diplomatic thing. They're sending you away home. Yeah, and, and, and that's ex but, but, but this is bureaucracy. You know, right. this is they 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 think about everything, um, and they forget that maybe it's it's individual humans on the ground. I mean, I think that's largely sometimes, you know, people become pieces on a on a risk board as opposed to the human beings that they are. And uh, yeah, so and, and, so and this when that is, gets forgotten. It's tough. Yeah, and, and this is where my girlfriend is the champion in the story. Is when mm -hmm. she went to like she went to uh, Assistant Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and basically told her I need to speak with the Secretary Blinken or I need to speak with the president. And that's when, you know, the, the day before I was released, it, the next day was April Fool. It was April 1st. Uh, so the guard comes, comes up to me. He's like, oh, you are getting... So this guard, at this point, I have like good relationship right. with him and, right. you know, sort of turned him. And he tells me you're getting released tomorrow, and I'm like, I'm not falling for your your, your tricks. Tomorrow <laughs> you is think, uh, April first. Do the Taliban abide <laughs> by the April first prank rule? Uh, and, and and that's I was like, oh, funny, haha. You are you're, you're, you're you know you're pulling my leg, and I I didn't really believe it. But that night, um, 
uh, I had that smuggled phone and I call my girlfriend. I'm like, hey, uh, so I think I'm getting released tomorrow. And you know what she says? She's, she's, I'm not ready. And, and I'm like, what the hell? What, what do you mean you're not ready? Do you have to go get pedicure and manicure and like, <laughs> you know, get, 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 uh, uh, go to the salon, get a, uh, get a haircut. What? But, but, but what she meant was that she has to do like this press release. She has to talk to like, cause Jake Tapper was like, uh, very much involved in this as well because he was, uh, he he broke the story and he knew about it the whole time and we were trying to keep it uh, uh keep it away from press because then it would become much much more much bigger right. and... much more fraught and much more dangerous yeah, yeah yes yeah. so yeah. you know she's like I have to tell Jake Tapper I have to prepare this uh you know uh, press release and so <laughs> so you you've been in you're in a dungeon an eight by eight dungeon with your brother you haven't showered in three months you're 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 being held hostage. You're about to come home, and the answer is you can't come home yet. I have to tell Jake Tapper. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I guess I'll 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 tell the Taliban, you know, to to hold off for a couple of days, and and you know, uh, tell tell the USG to hold off on that plane for for a couple of days. So in the end, uh, on on April first uh, of all days, uh, the US did send a plane they send a c-17 and you know ironically sure. uh ironically uh that plane could have fitted another 899 afghans that's uh, right. but it came just for me um and uh, i was uh i was the only one with some you know u.s special forces on the plane uh for for the security of it and i got to doha uh that day the fascinating story for me is that you have not just in the situation where you were at risk, you have been putting yourself at risk, not just for the United States, but for the Afghan people, for the refugees. And, and you've worked tirelessly. And the only thing that seems to be standing in your way at almost every turn is bureaucracy and poor decision making. Yeah, and, and and that's exactly you know I got to Doha and I get to meet my girlfriend and the first question I asked her I was like, how is the refugee situation? How mm -hmm. is how is our work? And she's basically like, well, everybody's been twenty four seven nonstop trying to get you out, so uh, we haven't done much. And I was like, oh no, and mm -hmm. I got back to work right then and there, and. Right. Uh, I, I come to, I, I flew to Washington DC and like I said before, my family is from Nebraska. My entire family lives in Nebraska. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't go to see my family. I go to DC and I start lobbying Congress again to, to figure something out. And, mm -hmm. and let's, and let's stop real quick now. So this is when he says, figure something out, there's, there's really kind of two methods for people, uh, who were translators or, or who worked for the American government during this time, there's humanitarian parole, and then there's the SIV program and the SIV program and humanitarian parole have some ridiculous absurdities to them. I think one of them to, to apply for it costs you $500 or $575, something along those lines yeah. to even apply now $575 you may think to yourself well you, you know you work a little bit you could probably put that together but this is in uh, Afghanistan the average annual salary is $400 you're you're saying yeah. to people just to apply you need to give us more than a year's worth of your wages and, just and a apply. lot of people did a lot of people did you know they I'm sure they uh, about 40,000 people applied and you know the USCIS got about 23 million dollar uh of uh, uh of money just in fees from those people but what's 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 sad john only 123 mm -hmm. cases were adjudicated from the humanitarian parole program you're telling me so so they got 23 million dollars from uh afghans who were applying 123 of those cases received humanitarian parole yes john that's and that's criminal and that's, and, and, that's and you know that, what that's john criminal. you know what john for for the uh the same program for ukrainian they waived the fee and they processed a hundred thousand in five months 
a hundred thousand people in five months hmm. and waived the fee. So, so we, we sorry, work in uh, Ukraine as well. What, and I'm what not against. I understand that. What yeah. what difference do you think? And I'm I'm just going to throw this out there. It's purely conjecture on your part. <laughs> uh, what would the reason be for uh, the difference in the way Afghans who had worked for the United States in service of protecting and assisting our war effort, why would they be treated so much uh, less in a less welcoming fashion than Ukrainians? And uh, I will take uh, your answer off air. First time, long time. Yeah. So, John, uh, I'm, I'm brown. And for the last month, I've been advocating for the Afghan Adjustment Act. And yeah. mostly I've been traveling to all the red states. And the first thing people see is my color. And based off of that is how the conversation is going to go. I also go, a lot of the people who go on these uh, on these uh, meetings with me are white. So, you know, I, I'm from Nebraska. I go to Nebraska. I go to the senator's office and I'm talking to the, uh, the, the director there. And, you know, I'm talking to her and I'm like, I'm your... Uh, I, I'm, I'm your constituent. I'm a veteran and I'm advocating for the Afghan adjustment. And she's like, mm hmm. Yes. OK, that's that's her answers to me. This white male starts talking to her and says, I'm a veteran. He's not even the constituent. And she picks up a pen and paper. She starts writing everything he's telling her and she's smiling. She's engaging. She's uh, so so so. If if it's not the the skin of the color, I I I don't know what else it is. It 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 it's it must be, for all that you've done and all that you've given and all that you've gone through, I, I can't imagine the frustration and, quite frankly, the anger that you must have felt, especially given that you know you're talking about the Afghan Adjustment Act. The Afghan Adjustment Act would allow a a path to a permanent citizenship for those who have been vetted and who have helped us. We have yeah. done this for almost every other war. There was a Vietnam yeah. uh, Adjustment Act. 1975. Uh, Cuban the, Adjustment Act. Yeah, uh, 1966. And, you know, all those, you know, the, right. the Indochina Migration Act of 1975 brought mm -hmm. 175,000 people and gave them permanent residency in the United States. The Cuban right. uh, Adjustment Act in 1966 actually gave a just, uh, permanent resident to 1.2 million people. And, and most recently, uh, the Iraqi Adjustment Act, uh, you know, after the Desert Storm. Uh, That's right. We've that done, I think we've done two Iraqi Adjustment Acts. Exactly. If, if and I'm then right. uh, again in the in the 2000s. And then the Iraqi SIV was actually better the, than the, the special immigrant visa was better than the Afghan SIV because the Iraqi SIV only required one year of uh, employment. The Afghan required two years. The Iraqi SIV, you could bring your extended family like your parents and your uh, siblings. Mm -hmm. In the Afghan Adjustment Act, you could only bring your children and wife. So we're, you know, Afghanistan is getting the short end of the stick everywhere right. here. And, and, you know, when we left Iraq in 2011, that's when ISIS started ramping up. And in 2014, they were controlling 40% of Iraq. And mm -hmm. that's when, and, and that year in August, we went right back. That's right. So three years Three years, we went back to Iraq. And, you know, if we leave Afghanistan the way it's going right now, we'll be right back. We've, we've left that country in, 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 in shambles. Like, we've left it in the I hands of people. I mean, it also people. speaks yeah. to, you know, this isn't the first time that the United States has uh, exercised its power throughout the world. And, and perhaps, you know, I'd like to believe not malevolently, but certainly with a carelessness that you would hope that this country wouldn't have, that there'd be more consideration. But the fact that, you know, we've abandoned our allies, forget about just the Afghan people and the idea that, you know, we went over there and we spent trillions of dollars to execute a war and then we walk away and you have a humanitarian crisis that has developed, uh, you know, when a group like the Taliban takes over and they're obviously being, uh, you know, isolated from the rest of the, you know, so-called civilized world. But more importantly, who are we as a country to turn our backs on the people 
that risk their lives for us. And the Afghan Adjustment Act, would all it would do is say, those that risk their lives for us, we owe you a debt of gratitude. And that debt of gratitude is a safer, more prosperous life. Absolutely, John. And you know, the humanitarian aid, uh, humanitarian crisis that you bring in, it's the worst we've ever seen. 1.1 million children will die if we don't intervene. Uh, they will die from starvation. It's one of the worst kinds of death you can have because it's slow, it's painful, and the parents sit there and watch as their right. children wither away. This is There's nothing worse than that. And, and the only way to solve that is through grassroots or grassroots organizations because we've been funding will the these taliban big... allow that i mean is there is there anything to can the ngos operate freely in a country controlled by as you even said yourself groups that are not necessarily in communication with each other in contact working for the same purposes mm -hmm. is the taliban not as in control of the operations as they they could be how do you even execute something like that nationwide yeah, so uh, I, like I said, you know, Taliban are not a monolith and grassroots organizations are allowed to work. And Taliban actually want humanitarian aid to go in because, you know, it it uh, it, it stops uh, civil unrest. You know, mm -hmm. when people don't have anything to eat, the, the first uh, finger that they're going to point towards is the Taliban. So that's why they are allowing that. But we've been funding uh, large aid organizations like World Food Program, like, you know, UN agencies, UNICEF, uh, mm -hmm. many others, uh, you know, Save the Children, uh, you know, Red Cross, all of those, but they're not effective. The reason they're not effective, because they, they, they're too big. They, 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 a lot of the aid that goes through them goes mm -hmm. directly to the Taliban. And then the Taliban decide who the aid they're going to give to. A lot of the times it's the families okay. of their own soldiers and their own soldiers and people that are their supporters. So what needs to happen is smaller grassroots organization needs to get a, a small percentage of all of the aid and distribute it across Afghanistan, especially because you know this, John, that you know Afghanistan is uh, a collection of you know many, many, many small uh, ethnicities. Mm -hmm. It's not one large ethnicity where you can send the aid to them and you make a, an effective uh, change. All of those... and it's not a monolith either. And, and different exactly. parts of the country are in different, you know, have an influence from Pakistan or they have an influence from other areas. And uh, it's a it's a really complex and and difficult even terrain. I mean, you go to the north and it's humid and lush and down in the south it's dry and i mean it's it's a you know a universe unto itself yeah absolutely john and 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 that's that's exactly what we need to do is and you know the afghan adjustment act i, I i'm gonna keep saying that because that's mm -hmm. the most important well, where piece does of that legislation stand out? So, so if people want to help with that and and you know if, if they want to help uh, and get involved and get this thing over the finish line i find it hard to believe that this isn't something that has more universal support. And I don't know if it's, I think what you said about it's brown, but it's also, to be honest, Muslim. You know, uh, in, in a country like this, where Christianity is obviously the dominant religion, mm -hmm. uh, Islam is considered an enemy at some level. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, it, it, it's, John. It's a difficult sell then only on that and not on its merits. But but you have to look at this, John. Afghans are not just any uh, population. They st stood by us for 20 years, shoulder sure. to shoulder, with, with our veterans. This is a veterans issue. This is a national security issue. You know, mm -hmm. the number one thing that the Afghan Adjustment Act does is vet all those people that we've brought over last year. So if anybody is concerned about that, this right. is the exact... Uh, bill that they should be asking for so that we can vet all those people. And in, in addition, I don't know to that there's th any, I, this is an important point to make for people. I don't know that there's any immigrant that comes to the shores of the United States, either through uh, legal bureaucratic methodologies or uh, some methodologies that are less so that are more vetted than Afghans. I honestly believe that, that the process that they are being put through and that they were put through to work side by side with the United States uh, military, it's the most rigorous vetting of any immigrants that come anywhere near this country. Yeah, absolutely. And and we are asking to do more, do more uh, vetting and, and and then, you know, let them let them uh, have a home here, because, John, if these people don't get here 
or, mm-hmm. or or don't get a pathway to resettlement they're going to be 100% sent back because we saw the election you know the house is already uh flipped and in you know 2024 what's going to happen then if if mm-hmm. we have a republican president in in the white house they will send all of these afghans back to afghanistan and they will be killed all of them every one of them you know uh, just one story of these 148 girls from uh, Asian University for Women in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. They were they they were actually not supposed to be brought here, but they but they 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 came here, and now they're they're going to school here. Like fourteen of them are going to Brown, nine at Cornell, sixty seven at Arizona State, and fifteen of them at Delaware University. They're mm-hmm. going to school. They are learning. They are in master's programs. Well, if if they're going so. to Arizona State, I don't think they're learning. I think <laughs> I think the other ones you mentioned. I think at Arizona uh, State, it may at just least be they're having pong. a good time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Safi, that's correct. You know, uh, uh, when you talk about this, what can people do to try and help get this thing uh, over the finish line as as quickly as possible? Is Uh, that the adjustment? Call your senators. We just need seven more Republican senators to get this passed. And understand this for people that are that are listening. There's also another element to this that we haven't really discussed, and that's the moral injury to the soldiers, because don't think for a second. You know, you've got American service men and women who fought for 20 years in Afghanistan. To what end? Nobody is really sure. They spent their lives. They sacrificed their families. They saw their friends get killed. And after 20 years, the Taliban is just back in power. And no one really knows uh, ultimately what the effort was for and, and what it's going to come to pass. But to add to that, the idea that those in Afghanistan who risk their lives to stand with us are not being helped adds a moral injury to an already wounded population emotionally, which is our servicemen and women. And and I think they're the ones that are working the hardest to get their allies. These are American servicemen and women. There's not working a to make single veteran. Count. There's right. not a single veteran that doesn't support the Afghan Adjustment Act. Right. I, I, I've been all across America. We've for the last two months, we've been to every Republican state in the U.S. and we have talked to every VFW. We've gone to every VFW post. We've gone to every right. Legion post, and we've talked to every veteran, and they all overwhelmingly support it because they, they are, understood what you did. Angry, they're That's angry, right. they're hurt, especially the Vietnam veterans. They understand, and they they know they dealt with the uh, moral injury. Uh, they know, they understand, and now the the the, the Afghanistan veterans that have uh, you know are, are dealing with the moral injury. It's 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 absolutely uh, horrific to see, and these veterans uh, suffering for for over a year now, and there's not a anything that's done for the Afghans to actually give give some relief to those veterans. It's it's a veterans issue. So Understood. do it for the veterans. Um, so well, we're we're going to keep on. Uh, Safi, I can't thank you enough uh, for coming by and talking to us. We're going to keep this on. Uh, obviously, you and I will be in contact in terms of other things that that we at the show can do and that I can do to help uh, put some pressure on and and get these things over the line, because uh, if we continue to believe that we are in any way a moral country, uh, this is very high up at the top of the list of things we would have to do to demonstrate that. Uh, so I really appreciate you uh, being here. I look very much forward to seeing the Broadway show about your life. I hope it's not a musical, to be quite frank. I'd like to see it. And no one, no one left behind is the organization that uh, that we had been in contact with, and obviously Safi's organization, which is called, if you want to say it again, Human First Coalition. The Human yeah. First Coalition. Uh, you've already done so much, Safi, and uh, and I'm sure uh, you will continue. And then we'll get that medical school back on track, and then you will become my gastroenterologist or something. Something's gonna. This yeah. relationship will continue. Yes, yes, John, absolutely. I want to be a Navy surgeon and I want to continue to serve my country. Uh, you're, you're a great man. Thank you so much, Safi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Woo! Wow. Uh, so we're back. Rob Christensen is joining us to Cara Mallard. Uh, that, that, that dude blew my mind. Join a privilege to hear his story. And that wasn't even all of his story. That clearly there's more and more and more, and I want to know all of it. Each time you'd get to it, he'd go, John, there's, there's a small part I'm not telling you. 
And then he would go <laughs> into, and it would be the most incredible. Like the thing I never mentioned is this. It was my brother. Yes. Who was with yes. Him. Yeah. Can I tell you the, the thing that I thought was most remarkable about it, his ability to maintain a sense of humor is actually the antidote. It's almost like a vaccine to being tortured in that way because it's such a higher level of humanity. I almost feel like his ability to maintain that is the key to having yeah. gotten through in some way. Absolutely. I agree. He was talking and, you know, I was thinking, wow, I think his his humor may have saved his life, especially with his talk with turn, turning the guards. And I'm like, okay, that took charisma and joy yeah. right. and charm right. and humor. It, yes. I think it saved him. And now afterwards to even tell the story, right? You're trying to get the story out mm -hmm. and to make it interesting and funny. It helps the cause so much more. Yeah. Oh my, when he said the worst part about being held by the Taliban was being stuck with his brother. That was my favorite. <laughs> a hot line. Yes. In some ways, you know, I've always viewed humor as a defense mechanism, right? But I, I also think there's something about it that is that is a life force. And I think I've, I've never viewed humor as a particular positive. I think I've always viewed it as like, it's a shield that I wore to hide something, to cover an insecurity or to protect myself. But when I see it from him, I viewed it in a very different light. I saw it as a, essential to the human condition. And in some ways as an asset that he used to do all these incredible things. It's almost the opposite of a shield. He's using humor to bring people closer. Rob Christensen. I know, that was really nice. Rob, you, I got have, heat you today. Been, have you been doing therapy? Is that, <laughs> is that what's... <laughs> oh, man. Retail therapy, maybe. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of affirmations in the mirror in the morning. What would be the best way, you think, Rob and Takara, in terms of getting veterans more involved in this aspect of it, because it's so personal to so many veterans about, you know, viewing them as allies and, and having left behind. I, I don't know the way to galvanize them in the same way. Or maybe it is the same way sort of that we did with the PACT Act, which is let's go through VFW and IAVA and all those other organizations and, and get them together as a, as a team again, which I know they are. I mean, I know they're all working on it. Uh, maybe it's a question of just consolidating. It. Right. There is legislation that needs to be passed, right? Is Afghan that Adjustment it? Act. Right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You just got to get the, the force behind it. It's, uh, again, right. it's a slam dunk and the hardest thing to do. Yeah. I was going to, you know, com combating misinformation. I think when speaking with veterans, helping them understand that it's really the same story. You have a government right. that promised you all something, you know, right. services when you came home from war and they reneged. And it's the same thing that's happening these Afghan translators right. and their families, it's the same thing. That, that, I think that's, that's a great point. And I think also that, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but in America, we tend to be somewhat myopic. Mm. A bit. And we view everything through the, the, the lens of, well, it doesn't affect me now because I, I live here. But I do think whenever this country fails to live up to its most basic moral precepts, it does affect us. You know, we weaken ourselves when we don't live up to that that obligation around the world. That's yeah. Let's actually be this gold standard that we keep saying we are. Right. Yeah. No, no question there. So that's, I mean, that's the next thing for us is, is just figuring out, okay, what's a way that we can uh, m maybe assist uh, Safi and, and the groups like no one left behind. And uh, I'm sure IAVA and VFW and, and American Legion and all those other groups that are working towards this. Uh, that'll be the next thing. And by the way, anybody listening who has some ideas on that, man, throw them in. I don't know where they throw them. The chat. I don't know. How, how do people do that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know if that's maybe just tell Elon Musk and he'll put them on Twitter. I, I don't know. Yeah. Best idea will be our Veterans Day wish. Best idea wins. Uh, Takara Mallard, Rob Christensen, thank you guys. Always a pleasure to see you cats. It's been almost seven hours <laughs> since I last Longest saw you. seven since hours of my it life. It hurt. It hurt. It's right. We miss yeah. each other. It's so beautiful. Uh, that is our show. Thank you very much to Safi Raouf uh, for joining us on the program. Uh, and uh, make sure to check out The Problem. It's airing right now on Apple TV+. Plus, We'll be back next week. Oh, we got, we got a hell of a podcast next week. I'm not even going to blow who's on it, but it's... Uh, it's is it me a, again? Uh, hopefully, <laughs> uh, it, it's, 
It's Jakar. So that's how you get on. All right. No, <laughs> no, it's actually me yes. again. <laughs> it is. Sure. It's it, both of you and Safi. It's just a repeat of everything that we've been talking there. All right, guys. Good seeing you. Peace. We'll talk to you Bye. soon. Bye.